Hello and behind me is a MiG-29, which is a Soviet fighter jet that first flew in 1977 and remains in production to this day. It's now the backbone of the Russian Air Force and is a fascinating design, so let's have a look around it. I make videos about planes. If you're into trip reports from flights around Australia and the world, and tours through significant aircraft and museums, then please check out my channel and subscribe. I'm also on Instagram and Facebook. In 1969, the Soviet General Staff issued a requirement for an advanced frontline fighter in response to the American F-15. But as news of the American lightweight F-16 program arrived, the Soviets split their program into their regular and a lightweight fighter program. They had Soviet names for these and I won't embarrass myself trying to pronounce them. The regular fighter program went to Sukhoi resulting in the Su-27, while Mikoyan was tasked with the lightweight fighter program and that's what we're looking at today. Original design proposals included this with side mounted air intakes similar to the MiG-25 with shoulder mounted wings. The higher positioning of the air intake did have benefits of keeping them away from foreign body ingestion and it also had a single tail fin. It later evolved to include a twin tail which I'll mention why later on. Another proposal was moving the air intakes to the underside and using a blended wing body layout where the wing structure essentially extends along the forward fuselage and can be used for storage and generate lift in itself. The latter performed better during wind tunnel testing and was put into production. This was top secret and to confuse American spy satellites, whenever it was outside they applied fake side air inlets as you can see on this American spy photo. Inside this very large ray dome is a Fazatron N-I-I-R-N-019 radar, and apologies for the mangling of the pronunciation of that, which was an upgraded version of the Sapphire 23ML used in the MiG-23M. They originally planned to develop a new radar, but the program was delayed so they went with the upgraded older system, which was unfortunate as the newer R-27 and 77 missiles could fire further than the radar system could see, thus limiting its capability. Famed CIA spy Adolf Tolkachev revealed this and many other radar designs to the Americans which only accelerated the need to upgrade the MiG-29's radar, which happened with subsequent models. This little object here is an infrared search and track head which detects and tracks objects that give off infrared radiation such as missiles or aircraft. These tend to have less range than radars but are passive and don't emit radar themselves which itself can be detected by the radar. So they tend to be used together with radar, but in theory, it could be used to track and fire missiles without using the radar at all, thus increasing stealthiness. Not fitted to this aircraft, but in this location is an air-to-air -air refueling probe. While the Su-27 was expected to fly longer missions outside of Russian airspace, the MiG-29 was expected to fly shorter missions, therefore fuel capacity wasn't a design priority. As the design evolved and it's become more of a multi-role fighter now, more fuel tanks were added to improve the range. There is a single 30mm cannon located in the port wing route, and it originally had 150 rounds but that was reduced to 100. This obviously didn't allow for much shooting, although the reality is that this would be used rarely, with missiles being the primary air-to-air -air weapon, but it was there if it was needed. It has these baffles on the side which expel the gun's exhaust gases out to the side instead of in front because they could then be ingested by the engines. A similar design was used in Rolls-Royce Avon powered Sabres as their larger cannons could expel enough gas forward that they could then be ingested by the engine and flame it out. It had six hard points for missiles, rockets, bombs and even a single nuclear bomb, although later K models did have eight hard points. Here's a Bangladeshi example with a centerline fuel tank as well. The wing itself is an interesting design. It has a mid-mounted swept wing with blended leading edge root extensions which improve airflow at high angles of attack and provide lift at low speed. This shape allowed for both the low speed lift and high speed performance without the need for heavy and complex variable sweep wings. It had automatic leading edge slats to improve stability during high angles of attack and large flaps on the trailing edge to improve low speed lift which helped out with landing on smaller runways and even aircraft carriers. It's interesting looking underneath the wing and how rough all of the components are, which would add more drag and increase the radar return. For comparison's sake, look at the smoother F-15 wing's underside. By the way, if you enjoy these tours, then please give the video a thumbs up and check out my channel for many more similar videos.
As mentioned earlier, the air intakes were moved from the sides in the MiG-25 to the underside which had the benefit of creating a narrower fuselage. But a disadvantage was that it would be closer to the ground, therefore at a higher risk of foreign body ingestion, which was especially a problem on rougher remote runways. To manage this, the intake ramps would close the main air intake and auxiliary air inlets above the fuselage would open. These ramps also changed position to create a shockwave to slow incoming supersonic air at high speed. Later models adopted mesh doors so that some air could still enter but debris would be blocked. Having a look at the nose landing gear and what's interesting is how solid it is to operate on rough runways but it's also much further aft with the cockpit sitting well forward of it. After the first prototype, they realised that it was kicking up debris into the air intake so this was rectified by moving it further back. But the debris remained a problem so you can see the reflector on this example. Moving it further back also centralises the weight. Sneaking in between the two engines and there was another pylon where a much needed auxiliary fuel tank could be added. But without it, the wider space between the engines would provide a lift itself and asymmetric thrust, in the case of an engine failure, wasn't a huge problem with such powerful engines anyway. Having this space between the engines would also make access for maintenance engineers easier and protect them from each other in the case of an uncontained engine failure. You may recall the de Havilland Comet actually had armour plating surrounding the engines to protect structures around them, but that obviously added significantly to their weight. Check out my tour around one of those in Duxford on my channel. Moving our way along the fuselage and we come to the main landing gear which was beefed up to again manage rough Soviet runways and a modified version was also used on aircraft carriers. Those needed extra strong landing gears due to the immense pressure of the carrier landings. Moving further aft we have the all moving tailplane which is fairly standard for fighters and provides greater manoeuvrability. Then we get to the engines, which are two Isotov RD33 turbofans producing 18,300 pounds of thrust each with afterburners pushing it to a top speed of Mach 2.3. Looking inside engine number two's exhaust, and you can see the lighter coloured afterburner and the structures of the variable exhaust nozzle. In the centre line, you have the air brake positioned between the engines, and this would lift both up and down as needed. Behind the black bulb is the brake parachute. Underneath you can see the ventral hard point and again this could also generate lift. Now using a single engine was considered as this would improve manoeuvrability as we see with the F-15 but the added power and redundancy of two engines was preferred. Of interest, apparently this could actually take off with a single engine and a combat load and the second engine could be started in air to speed up the whole interception process. Taking a step back, we have the twin vertical fins with interestingly small rudders. As you saw earlier, a single fin design was originally planned, but they moved to a twin fin design, as this would allow for greater redundancy if one was damaged or failed. It also allowed engineers to spread the vertical surface area over two small fins rather than a single larger one, thus allowing for a smaller overall height and therefore smaller hangers. There's a whole array of electronic warfare and communication antennas on both fins as well. Now the engine might look long, but it has a relatively short combustion chamber, hence why the engines tend to create darker smoke than most other turbofans of the era. Obviously pollution isn't a major concern for the Air Force, but this would be more visible to the naked eye. You'll see again how small the wheelbase is, which is the distance between the nose and the main landing gear. This did make taxing more of a challenge, but did allow engineers to place much of the mechanics close to the centre to maintain the centre of gravity. It features a high mounted bubble canopy, addressing the poor visibility of earlier Soviet fighters. As this was designed for close air combat, visibility was extremely important. As you can see in this older MiG-23 and MiG-21, the cockpit is sunk into the fuselage, which did help reduce drag, but also reduced visibility. I couldn't get inside this jet, so I'm relying on photos from the museum. Of interest, it isn't painted in the brighter aqua colour of many Soviet jets, and I'm not sure why. It's all analogue here, as you would expect in a jet designed in the 1970s, but later models did introduce a glass cockpit. A major advance, though, was the Shell 3 UM-1 helmet mounting aiming device, and sorry, I'm sure I pronounced that wrong as well. This allowed the pilot to simply turn their head at the target and that information would then be sent to the missile rather than him having to turn the whole aircraft towards the target. 
multiple MiG-29s have been lost in combat. Six were shot down during the NATO intervention in Kosovo by both F-15s and F-16s. Five were shot down by F-15s during the Persian Gulf War, although some Russians did report that they shot down a Panavia tornado, although the Brits contest that. It's believed the Israelis have shot down an unknown number of MiG-29s and multiple Sudanese jets have also been shot down. Eritrean MiG-29s have also been shot down by Ethiopian Su-27s. An unclear number have been shot down in Ukraine, although I expect it'll be a while before we know all of those details. While this does seem like a fairly high loss rate, and it is, it's worth noting that most were export models and the Russians tend to keep their latest technology for themselves, therefore these jets were all flying with one arm tied behind their back. But that's little comfort for the countries that bought them. This one on display here is an earlier MiG-29A, although there has been a steady load of upgrades over the last four decades. Remember that production started in 1981 and it remains in production to this day. The MiG-29S variant includes a dorsal hump and the added space was used for extra equipment and fuel. The MiG-29M, which was originally designated the MiG-33, first flew in 2005 and features a fly-by-wire controls airframe upgrades, increased fuel capacity, and an upgraded engine and electronic warfare equipment. Some of the analog dials inside the cockpit were also replaced with the screens. There is also a 29K model which was designed for the Navy and is now flown by the Indian Navy. It features an upgraded landing gear, arrestor hook, folding wing tips, radar absorbent paint, and other parts of the M upgrade. The latest variant is the MiG-35, which some might suggest was a bit of a marketing ploy with the new name as it's still fundamentally a MiG-29. It entered service in 2019 and the primary upgrades are weapons and avionics. Over 1,600 MiG-29s have been built and it remains in production and flown by many nations around the world. If you enjoyed the video, please give it a thumbs up and check out my channel for many other Soviet era aircraft, including the Tu-144 supersonic passenger transporter, AN-22 and the Buran Space Orbiter. Thanks for watching.